so with the, this we will start with the qualitative this uh, data collection method and the data collection method which we are going to discuss is the in depth interview so we all had the listen to the participant few participants who had experience of this in depth interview so this in depth interview is like a journey on the highway so suppose if you are driving a car on a highway to reach your destination so how will you plan that particular drive and how you wish that your journey should be so we will see at the end what is the analogy between conducting an interview and driving a car on the highway to reach your destination so, so again we said that conducting an interview is like driving a car on a highway to reach the destination so the first thing in conducting an interview is you have to come out of the mindset of a data collector and you have to come out of the mindset of a doctor because as a doctor we think that we know very much and uh, we are in a habit of talking so most of the time it's we who talks it's we who talk and then what happens that we don't give opportunity to the other person to talk so talk minimum and again like in the broad principle which we have discussed in guiding the interview guide that you should refrain yourself from asking close ended questions so come out of the mind of that data collector and the doctor and then you think because you have done a thorough literature review so you should be in that mindset of collecting the data of a particular research question like in this case the research question is the how the digital learning is uh you no know, perception of the student how it is uh, changing the perception of the students towards the conventional teaching so if you do a thorough literature research then you have a fair idea you have got a interview guide also so it will help you in coming out of the mindset second thing is you should memorize your interview guide memorize means i'm not saying that line by line because it is not possible but since you have framed your questions you know what is the sequence of the question because when you are asking this question in the field you will not be looking at the guide and then asking again you have always have a copy of interview guide with you in case you miss out on something or you want to check whether you have asked all the questions or not then you can refer to the interview guide but it is not uh, uh, advisable that you look every time to the interview guide and then ask the question to the participant because while you are listening to the participant you are doing a active listening in the interview guide also always have uh, you should leave some space in the right one uh, third right uh, part of the interview guide because you need to reframe questions then and there only and you are expected to make notes also while conducting the interview ideally there will be two person so uh, the other person may take the notes the uh, work of a note taker and you also have you should be with a pencil and that interview guide so if anything because many times what happens that while you are conducting the interview in the probing you need to ask the question but since the person is speaking you are not going to interrupt him then and there so you wait for the person to finish that particular part and then you ask your question but you should also be writing that question otherwise when the person will finish his answer you will forget to ask the question so the so th that's why it is advisable that you should memorize your interview guide and then again one more thing is that you should test and practice the initial interview guide with your friends or with few uh, patients or the stakeholders with whom uh, who are not going to the part of your uh, research and you are doing it just for pilot testing and during the pilot testing if some interview is good you can include that interview in your data analysis so always pilot test the interview with few of the stakeholders or few of the participant that will help you in memorizing the guide in having a comfortable flow with the participant and be able to frame a questions based on the response of the responder so now this question is for all of you 
the participant asked for interview guide. I think this we have discussed this in the last session also. So what will you do? So you should give the rough interview guide to the participant. Now about the location of interview. What is what do you think where the interview should be? Like in, in this case, where there is a uh, in the, the same question which you are thinking and we which you are working on which you are working like the perception of students, how the digital learning is changing their perception towards the conventional teaching. What should be the location of the interview with the students? Anyone can, uh, can you type in the chat box? Location, classroom, okay. Okay, I'm talking of medical students now. We are talking of medical students uh, and the research question is like, because you can carry out this research in your own institute also, hostel. Okay, in common room maybe, yes. So uh, in lecture room, where the student is comfortable, where they are comfortable, okay. So yes, you are very right. You should not be conducting this interview maybe in a committee room or maybe in the dean's uh, chamber or in the principal cham chamber. Uh, where there will be far uh, cafeteria, obviously, but in cafeteria, there will be a lot of disturbance because for in-depth interview, you want a quiet place where you can record the responses because in audio uh, recording a lot of, no if there is a lot of noise, it will be difficult for you to make transcript. So you want a quiet place and where you, and in cafeteria, there will be, uh, it, it is usually crowded on phone. Okay, on phone, uh, yes, in case, uh, of pandemic when you cannot meet with the other person, uh, then it can be done. But uh, ideally, uh, that rapport is not there over phone unless you are talking one to one across the table. So it is much better. But again, yes, you can do it if, uh, like in case of uh, during the COVID, uh, many people they have conducted interview over phones also. So that you it can be done. You can do it over Skype also. You can do it. That is again the other form. That is the digital one. You can. <laughs> use that mode also but uh, the location should be as you said it can be a, a student room you can ask from the student where he will feel comfortable maybe in the hostel uh, they are into the in their casual uh, uh, mood and I, uh, I mean it's it's up to them if they want to be interviewed in the hostel it is up to them but a classroom or any place in the class where they usually come for the class or any room in the department where they usually come in some off time where they don't have class, when they don't have class, you can call them. The only thing is that it should be a neutral place so that they should not feel intimidated that whatever, if they give some response and you know, they will be uh, under the camera or you know, under the lens. So that should not be there. And again, uh, you should take consent for recording also. So if for recording, uh, you should have ideally two recorder and we have talked about the recording that you should take consent and if somebody is not agree for recording, then uh, you can uh, take the notes. But for that, uh, you should be very quick in taking notes because it is, it is very difficult to ask questions simultaneously and take notes. So uh, it's, it's a bit difficult. I have not done uh, a qualitative interview only by taking uh, notes. Maybe uh, both things you can do. So uh, battery, definitely, you should check the battery of the device if it is a recorder or battery of your phone and its memory because it takes, if the interview is for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, it takes a lot of space over your phone or if it is a recorder, then on that memory card. So always uh, check the memory of your device, the charging, the battery level. And if you are recording it over mobile, then you should uh, do it in the aeroplane mode. Because in the normal calling mode, a call may come and it'll, that interview will be, it will be stopped. Uh, it will not be recorded. So you can make that aeroplane mode on and then do the recording. So this is about the recording. So there is one question that you should restart recording just before taking the consent for interview. What do you think? So both before and after. Yes, so uh, you, can, you can start recording uh, the, the general discussion also. 
and uh, definitely before and after or before also you are because you are telling the person and you are asking him that he is uh, agreeing to give consent for your interview so yes it is both uh, before and after and always ask questions uh, you should always ask probing questions we have discussed about this probe and prompts in the last session so uh, just a few activities for all of you consider yourself as a interviewer and what next question would, would you like to ask to the respondent so this is the question how has the patient dementia impacted the relationship dynamics in the family if i ask this question so i will frame the other question so the other question is, the response is my mom now requires 24 hour care i'm often stressed about this and it's putting a lot of strain on my marriage so if this is the response now what should be the next question please type in the chat box So can uh, am I audible to all of you? Yes. Can you say how it is affecting? Anuvarshni is writing. Can you please elaborate what problems are you facing regarding the strain in your marriage relationship? Yes, very good. Because you are probing further that what what is the strain? Because that person is saying that it is putting a strain on my marriage. Can you elaborate? how it is affecting the marriage how it is affecting the marriage marriage relationship yes so that that's the that's the probe which you are doing yes very right now coming to the next question so now next question is why do you prefer the auto injector to intravenous injection auto injection to intravenous injection and the person is saying the auto injection is convenient because i can administer it at home and it takes less time so if you need a follow up questions following this what would be the question please type in the chat box how was it different from the previous one you used yes very good how many times a day you have to administer the drug can you please explain how your previous experience any dis disadvantage you are facing with it yes rightly said you can again ask that uh, if it is taking less time yeah how, how what what do he mean by what does uh, he mean by taking less time how much time the previous one was taking so that uh, quantification of time you can ask and regarding that convenience also you can ask hypothetical question like if that uh, auto injector mode was not there and intravenous was uh, uh, there then what uh, uh, inconvenience it would cause to him so this hypothetical question you can ask now the next question is what signs do caregiver observe that tell them their loved one is having asthma we have seen these questions before also so the response is i know my daughter is having a hard time with her asthma when she is wheezing now if you have to write a follow up question what follow up questions can you ask like uh, she is saying that my daughter is what other symptoms faced by your daughter kavita is writing okay and having a hard time yes can you please explain how hard 
because you have to frame questions from the keyword which that lady or the person has said so now you want to know more about like what do uh, what does she mean by having a hard time when she is wheezing so what problem uh, does she face uh, by saying this hard time so you have to elaborate on that hard time and on that wheeze maybe some pattern of wheeze because that management will be a little bit more but initially you have to frame questions because you want to elaborate more on this hard time think from the perspective of a coder if you have to code this you need a supporting sentence so just these two sentences will not work so in framing the questions or while taking the interview we have discussed that always think from the perspective that you have to do the coding and you have to analyze so always elaborate get more elaboration on the concept which the person is saying so now you have to ask that uh, what 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 that lady mean by the hard time or what other uh, apart from wheezing what other difficulties which she is facing so this you should be asking now you may ask the same questions in a different way to get the nearly uh, complete answer so you should reframe your questions in one or the other way but while doing so you have to remain polite because then the person you should not make a any non verbal gesture that the person is not understanding your question so you can reframe the question in a polite manner and you can ask the question now with this we have discussed that do ask silly questions because uh, in the previous hiv example also i said that if i am asking that what does she mean by touch so that meaning of touch you need to ask and it may look silly to someone but you need to ask silly questions so now read this question the doctor the participant is saying that the doctor came very late what will be the next question yes how much late what is the usual time how late is he or what is the or you can if you have to frame a hypothetical question uh, then how, how will you frame so all of you are right in this case how long do you wait so in this case you only need the quantification of the time and in this question if the doctor says that i usually remain engaged in department meeting after lunch now what what next question will you ask So the doctor is saying that I usually remain engaged in department meeting after lunch. <clears throat> so, what uh, question can you ask? How much time on an average departmental meeting? How long do you engage? Yes. And usually remain engaged. So, what do he mean by you know by this term usual? And then maybe. further elaboration on how frequently yes anuradha shivangi veena and what maybe what do they do in the departmental meeting if the doctor is saying departmental meeting then what do he mean uh, what does he mean by departmental meeting what is the activity or what are the points which they discuss during the departmental meeting so those further elaboration on the context yes maybe agenda <clears throat> or maybe the topic which they usually discuss because every day if it is or if it is occurring very frequently then what are the talking points in the departmental meeting that you should be getting uh, answered from the participant so the idea behind asking such silly question is that you are not assuming the terminology which the person is answering by as per your understanding because you have a understanding of the terms which we are using commonly but we don't you should not assume the same meaning which you understand and what the participant is conveying so that's why you should ask silly questions and these examples are just to exemplify those questions like a silly questions now about the note taking you should do the note taking during the interview and we have discussed that uh, ideally there should be two people 
one person should check with the backup of the battery and should be taking the interview and should be uh, helping in maintaining a silent environment around the uh, two people who are uh, responder and who are the interviewer. So the other person can take the interview very conveniently. So note taking should be done by the other person who's the, there. And uh, it, it is an important part because we'll see in the coding also, uh, it is while uh, the person is saying something, if you want to add something, whatever, whatever is going in your mind, then you can uh, do that. The next is after the interview. What you should be doing after the interview? So you should uh, come, uh, just, uh, uh, you should say thanks to the participant and write your notes and reflections. And then you should try giving updates of the project in the, to the participant. So uh, after we will see this in the ethical this thing also, after you publish your manuscript also, or before you publish your manuscript, after you make the transcript, you should share the transcript to the participants also to show them that, that is, this is the verbatim or this is the response which they have given to you. And uh, it can be done either through the uh, mail or through the WhatsApp, or if the person is uh, illiterate, then again, you can uh, like uh, not illiterate. That means if you don't have any WhatsApp or email ID, then you can send it through hard copies also. So that uh, it should be shared with the participant. The uh, transcript of the individual should be share, shared with the participants. So being a good interviewer means that you must have a good knowledge. Uh, Monica is asking that uh, we are recording, then what is the point of note taking? Uh, yes, there is a point of note taking because everything is getting recorded. But many a times uh, you may have something going on simultaneously at that time. So you write your memos also, not you, it is the other person or you may also write uh, in the side. I said that in the interview guide, keep some space so that uh, you can write that and you can write the non-verbal part also, like Ria is saying uh, that, uh, you know, how the person may be making some faces because ideally we will say that if you can uh, do the video recording, then you can note down the non-verbal part also. So if you are doing the video, video recording, then there is no, uh, then you can leave this note taking part. Otherwise that uh, non-verbal gestures or some other thing which is going on then and there in the room, someone is coming or the wife, many times it happens that two people are uh, sitting and uh, you are asking from the respondent and the other person also starts speaking. Then you can write it in the note taking that, you know, the other person started speaking, how you control that, all that procedure, you can write as a note taking. So this is the point of note taking. So as an interviewer, you uh, should be knowledgeable because uh, uh, you have the, done a thorough literature review. So you should be knowledgeable then only because Jennifer also made this statement that if you know a lot about that topic, then only you have that insight of asking questions. So you should have a good knowledge about the topic and you should have that semi-structured interview guide with you. Uh, um, again, which is not a very uh, rigid, it is a highly flexible guide and it just guides you how you should be conducting the interview. It, it, uh, that it shows that you are uh, structured and then uh, you should ask simple, easy questions. They should be clear in your mind and the question should be very short and crisp so that the other person should understand. The wordings of the question should not be like that, where the person is not able to understand your questions. You should be gentle enough, you should be patient, should not interrupt the person in between. You should finish, you should wait to finish the respondent to finish his turn. And then if you need to ask anything, you can write that questions and you ask once the participant has finished his response. You must uh, listen attentively. Obviously, the active listening is required here because you have to frame the questions from his response. Probing, probing is not possible without this active listening. And uh, you should be very open. You should not be judgmental, especially to the sensitive issues. Like if you are talking to a person who is HIV positive, no way you can show your nonverbal judgmental thing to that person. So you should be very much in a non-judgmental tone, that non-verbal gesture, and you should be flexible in asking questions. 
again uh, it is like you are steering it should feel like we said in the beginning that it is like driving a car on the highway so like you are there on the, you are the driver and you are at the steering so you should know when to stop like riya said in this in her statement then maybe even if the interviewer interviewee is uh, deviating from the topic many a times they will start saying something which is not relevant to the your uh, topic of uh, research topic but again you bring those uh, uh, interview this uh, respondent back to the track you may also get side track many a times you start asking something which you think later that it is not up to the uh, you know it is not uh, related to your idea of research then you can again come to the track so you should be on the track most of the time because you are the driver of that interview so uh, probes and prompts will help you and always have this research question in your mind uh, which you have decided to uh, do a research and then you should be very critical critical means you should be always show gesture that you are not in neither in disagreement nor in agreement because if you are in agreement maybe if you show some gesture they may say the participants are also very smart if they say that you are getting happy by their response they'll start saying more of that and they, even if they don't that again social desirability thing may come so it, uh, they will think that uh, you know you are uh, getting happy by some of the responses so they will try to say those responses more so that's why neither you should be in a agreement mode nor you should be in a disagreement mode you should be maintaining a very neutral face and very neutral neutral body language and if there is any ambiguity you should ask in the question and then you should remember what you have already uh, what they have already said that means you should not be repeating the questions if they have said something uh, that's why you have to be very attentive you cannot be uh, you cannot lose your focus even for a fraction of seconds because that will uh you know deviate you will be deviated from the uh, that that interview and then in between you should summarize that's why we call it as check posting or the uh, in uh, this uh, you know sign posting so you should be summarizing in between because what by this what you do is that you show them that you are listening you are actively listening and you are uh, interested in them so that uh, summarization in between will help them to understand that you are interested in their talk and that will help them in making a rapo and they will come up with more responses ma'am uh, ma'am excuse me can you just repeat point 7 my network cut off in between okay so 7 was so you are steering i said that uh, uh, you are the because you are the driver here so the uh, steering this thing is in your control the steering is in your control so it is you who will bring back because in the beginning we talked that conducting an interview is like driving a car on the highway so if you are deviating if the person is deviating from the interview you have to bring back on the research question uh, that person or even if you if you digress for a moment then also you have to bring yourself also to that particular track of your research question so that's why i meant by this uh, steering and uh, you should use those prompts and then uh, use all those uh, uh, commands to bring that person back obviously in a very neutral and polite manner to bring back to the uh, on that uh, way of uh, doing the interview okay ma'am thank you ma'am so it you should allow for a natural flow to go on while conducting the interview so the driving analogy is like we said that conducting an interview is like driving a car on the highway and you have to prepare beforehand like if you have to travel for 4 hours 5 hours even for 12 hours you prepare yourself similarly if you have to conduct the interview you have to prepare yourself so how you will prepare yourself so if there is a low fuel obviously low fuel is equivalent to the low battery of a recorder because uh, if there is less fuel there will be interruptions in between the second is a clear road if there is a clear road the smooth there will be smooth interview so that place where you choose to conduct the interview that should be a quiet one so that the interview should go uninterrupted in between there should not be too many people who come and interrupt so that you will uh, have a 
loss of your uh, thinking process and then there will it will not be a very good interview so that place is very important again high speed so if it is a very high speed then it will be a poor narrative so don't go very fast you go very patiently in an appropriate uh, speed because uh, if it is a very high speed that means you have not enjoyed the journey because you have not seen the uh, scenario you have so if there is a high speed the narrative will be poor that means the person did not enjoy the journey and if it is a very slow speed then the quality will be compromised that means that there are uh, there, there will be too much information and there can be information which is not related to your study. So in this case, it should not be neither very fast or should not be very slow. So it should be a good speed, appropriate speed to have a good narrative. And you should take few, uh, I mean, uh, in highway, you take few tea breaks. So the narratives which are not related to your research are like a tea break. And then in between, there will be natural call. So again, this natural call is also like narratives not related to research. And jam, like many times, the participant with whom you are taking, uh, doing the interview, they pick some important call or you also allow them to take some important call. So it is like jam in your uh, driving drive. So that may hamper your journey towards your destination. So that's the analogy between uh, driving and uh, uh, this thing, conducting an interview. So I hope if you are well prepared, like you prepare yourself before any long drive to the highway, then uh, the, the likewise, if you are prepared for interview, then I hope with the repeated practice, you can conduct a good interview. So now... Uh, So this is one uh, interview, just see this carefully, we will ask questions after you see this interview. My name is Allison Jones. I understand that you've been to several chart trainings, and I am the qualitative interviewer, and so I'm interviewing people in and asking them for feedback about the training and how it went for them and all of that. So um, is it okay if I talk with you about that? Yes, of course. Great. So um, what is your name? Shea Bloomer. Okay. Profession? Um, I'm a nurse. Great. And uh, how long have you been a nurse? Uh, I've been a nurse for 12 years. Okay. Um, did you enjoy the training? Yes, I did. Would you say that you enjoyed it a little bit, a medium amount, or a lot? Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Great. Okay. And um, did you learn something by the training? Yes, I did. Excellent. Okay. Um, and would you recommend it to a friend? Yes, I would. Great. Um, okay. So, can you give me an example of something you learned? Uh, for example, um, some pre people have learned that they may think that they're not discriminating and that they're very open and respectful of everybody, but then um, when they actually get down to it and they go through the training and they understand that there are things that they, that they actually do have some sort of biases in them and they may not have known it, but then the training helps them discover it and then just helps them be very self-reflective and that sort of thing. Do you think that maybe that's something that you learned in the training? Um, certainly, I think some of that was covered in the training. Um, we also learned um, about taking sexual history um, and effectively taking a sexual mm. history, which is a sensitive topic and it's not something that I was trained in in my um, professional education. Mm -hmm. um, we also learned about patient confidentiality and the importance of maintaining patient confidentiality in order to protect our patients. Mm -hmm. um, and both of those, I think, were very relevant for me. I'm sorry, C can you say that last part again? I got distracted. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, it's, it's okay. Um, 
I, I believe I was talking about the, how we talked about the importance of patient confidentiality and maintaining confidentiality of patient records mm -hmm. in order to protect our patients. Um, you've been talking a lot about what you learned. And now I'd like to ask you a little bit about what you've done differently. I mean, it's one thing to say we learned something, but then it can be quite another thing to actually try to do something differently. So can you tell me anything that you may have done differently because of the training? Uh, so what I'm doing differently since the training? There must be something that you did differently. I mean, think about it, you know, anything. Because you, you mentioned these different things that you learned about. So can you think? about, you know, maybe keeping your voice softer or spending a longer time with patients or um, being more empathetic than you were before, any, anything like that. Do you think any of those may be things that you did differently? Um, yes, I'm, I'm sure they must think that I'm more empathetic than I was before. Great. Okay. So um, now let's talk about the training methodology. Do you think it was effective? Yes, it was. Great. And um, how was it effective? Well, it was a very interesting Jack training. I was happy Jack to be there. The Great, but it helped you. It helps you learn and do your work differently. Well, um, perhaps. Now I'm a little bit confused because it seems that you're contradicting yourself. I, I think earlier you said that it helped you learn and you were doing something differently, but now you seem to be changing your mind. And so now I'm just very confused. Can you clarify for me whether you did something differently because you learned from the training or you didn't? Well, what I mean to say is that I think that I've always done my job well and I like my job. and. I think that I've always been respectful of my patients, but I think that there are certainly some things that I'm doing a bit better than I did before the training. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, so that's all really good. Thanks. So um, would you like us to provide you with more training on this or a any other topic? Well, yes, actually. There are a number of different trainings that we um, profit from at my facility and um, that I personally would like to attend. Um, I am very interested in a health administration course that's offered in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. um, at Howard University. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also very interested in um, having some uh, more in-depth training on diabetes, which of course is a large concern for us. Mm -hmm. um, I am also interested in taking some further training in um, care of um, pregnant women who are HIV positive. Um, they're so there are, I think, a number of, of trainings that would be of interest. Um, can you just say that again? I didn't get that last part. Um, pregnant women with are uh, HIV positive? OK. Um, OK. So um, what are some of the other problems at your facilities? Well, one of the, tr one of the concerns that we've been going on and around with the administration about is um, some of the water issues in the examination rooms. Um, well, the running water isn't working in some exam rooms, which limits the number of rooms in which we can do certain procedures because the water's not running or, or there's not, um, uh, so, so that's one issue, the, the water's not working in a number of the exam rooms. Um, I think there's also um, some communication issues, some systems issues between uh, the, the pharmacy folks and the people who are in the wards, um, and I, I think that um, it would be useful for uh, hmm. the hospital if we were able to have some communication um, issues resolved between uh, the pharmacy and the ward. Hmm. Okay, great. Um, I think it's about time for us to wrap up. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Uh, I, no, I, I don't think so. Did I answer all your questions sufficiently? Yes, just great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. My name is Allison Jones. So uh, did you see the uh, interview? I'll just uh, show you one checklist on the basis of what you can decide whether it was a good interview or it was a bad interview. So we'll share this checklist with you.
This is taking some time to open, I guess. So yes. So this is checklist for processing and quality monitoring of interview. So in this, you can see we have this initially, it, it was a long uh, checklist, but we have modified it uh, with 10 questions. So this is decide and fix uh, mutually agreed agreed date, venue and time for interview. And after after administrative approval, yes or no. Then did you record, did you check the recorder battery status and memory? This is second. Third is keep a notebook and pen for note taking if face to face interview is there. The fourth is keep the hard copy of interview guide. The fifth is introduce yourself and state the purpose of the study. The sixth is verify the concern of the participants and ask if the respondent has any questions uh, to write. And this in uh, seventh is inform when you start recording. Eighth is provide adequate time to respond. Ninth is you should show interest and curiosity. Tenth is in the end you ask as exit questions. Then again, 11 debrief and summarize main points. So this is very important. That's why it has been highlighted in yellow because after you took the interview, you have many things to say. So just debrief the participants, whatever they have said, and then check the audio if the recording is properly or not, and then store the consent. Uh, again, like I said that it, you should be having the written consent in a file and uh, have it in, at a safe place. And this checklist you can mention in the methodology also while you write your paper, or while you write a proposal, you can mention about this checklist and you can uh, write that you have used a checklist to uh, assess the quality of interview which uh, you did or which was conducted. So this was one checklist and it will be shared to you. So you can use this checklist. Again, this was one interview. So can anyone, uh, so this, in this, I just want all of you to unmute yourself, those of you who want to respond and say, what were the bad points which you, uh, uh, thought i mean in this interview which you just saw so bad interview many have so people have written very uncomfortable okay uh there was like the lady was attending telephone like uh, the mobile phone uh and also showing no interest in talking actually okay the other lady uncomfortable okay yes very right trying to look over the time looking for okay as if uh, winding up at the yes yes very right and Jennifer has written that bad interview, no eye to eye contact, the interview taking the most part, uh, it was uh, part than the, I mean, interview talking, uh, that person was talking more than the respondent. And that mobile phone, you have also talked, uh, no interest also, you people have talked, no briefing, uh, debriefing was done, this also, you people have told me that interviewer is a distracted by the phone. Yes, May, most of the time she was looking at the phone. She and was then, learning, yes, uh, and uh, then the interviewer was, uh, giving more close-ended questions than open-ended questions. And yes. she was answering for the participants sometimes. And then lastly, she's saying you're contradicting yourself. But basically the answer she thinks she's contradicting is the answer she had herself given before. It is yes. not the participant herself who's told all those things. Yes, very right. <laughs> very right. And uh, Amit is writing body language was not good. And Amit some of the questions in the beginning were like, yes, yes, no. Yes. Uh, and in between also they had some yes or no questions yes and again like regarding training also she asked like low medium and all those close-ended options vigya is also writing provided answer to the respondent so yes you're right you rightly observed all these things and tone of voice change in between and more, many times she was saying i didn't get can you please repeat can you please repeat so this was showing that she's not attentive when listening so those were some of the things which you noticed now see again this interview. Hello, my name is Allison Jones. I understand that you've taken a series of chart training workshops. I'm doing qualitative evaluations about the training so we can learn more about how participants think about their training and what they've learned. Um, so I'd like to ask you about your experience with the chart trainings. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, can you tell me your, your name, please? My name is Shay Bloomer. Shay Bloomer, okay. Can I call you Shay? Yes. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and Shay, what do you do for a living? What's your profession? I'm a nurse. You're a nurse. How long have you been oh, nursing? Oh, I've been a nurse for 12 years. Oh, interesting. So first I'd like to start out and just kind of get your immediate reaction to the training, your memories of, of how it felt to be in the training. Um, what was your favorite part of the training and your least favorite part of the training? Um, well, uh, I would say that my favorite part of the training was that the facilitators really took time to have discussions with us and it was a very open um, kind of discussion that we had about a number of the, the topics that we were discussing and I felt like um, I wasn't just being told things. It wasn't a one-way sort of experience. We were very much um, learning from one another and um, it was exciting to be in a group with my peers and to be able to discuss some of the issues that we confront every day and learn different ways of approaching them. Mm -hmm. I know the training was a while ago but um, I'm wondering if in these conversations that you were having with the facilitators and with some of your colleagues, can you remember um, any particular topic that was especially interesting for you? Well, one of the uh, topics that we talked about um, was taking sexual histories. And um, as nurses who are working in, in HIV care and in testing, um, it's often important for us to take a sexual history, but it can be very uncomfortable, for example, um, depending on who the patient is. We have patients who come in who seem too young for us to need to take a sexual history, patients who frankly seem too old to, for that to still be relevant. And um, mm -hmm. it was interesting to talk about how we all sort of approach it in a different way and how a number of us, frankly, were fairly uncomfortable with the topic. But um, having this kind of discussion about it really helped me to feel um, more empowered to talk to all of my clients about their sexual history. Mm -hmm. So um, I heard you say that you're now taking these sexual histories differently. And I'm wondering if because you're taking them differently, if different kinds of information actually comes out from your consultation with the patient. Yeah, I think certainly because the truth is that I was so uncomfortable doing them before that I often sort of skipped over it or um, found ways to just ask yes, no questions and get through it. And so now that I'm more comfortable taking the history, I'm actually doing it with all of my patients. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any ways that that might affect um, the actual care the patients receive? Definitely, because before I wasn't thinking about a number of these patients in terms of needing the kinds of services like HIV testing, um, and now I realize that the elder generation is sexually active and I'm taking their sexual history and mm -hmm. some of them do need to be tested. Can you tell me um, anything else that you remember learning from the training? Well, one of the things that we discussed a lot at the training um, was patient confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel like I was aware that confidentiality was important. I was not aware of the many ways that we can accidentally violate patient confidentiality. Mm -hmm. And um, it's caused me not only to look at my practice um, personally, but to also be thinking about the way things sort of happen in our clinic because mm -hmm. Um, there are a number of things happening in our clinic that I actually think are making it harder for us to maintain patient confidentiality. Hmm. That's interesting. Can you tell me more about that? Well, for example, we have a very small waiting area that's directly in front of where all the patient records come out. And we have a limited number of consultation rooms. So a number of times during the day, um, conversations need to happen among providers and there aren't very many places for that to take place. And often what ends up happening is that at the desk where people are waiting to sort of sign in and things like that, we are having discussions about patients. Mm -hmm. um, and we always sort of think, I think, of that desk as being a barrier, but in fact it doesn't block sound. And so I think that that might be an issue that we need to have um, a safe space for providers to be able to have discussions about patients. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like this is something that you've noticed at your workplace, that this area may not be um, it may have been treated as a confidential space when in fact it's not. Has, um, have you noticed anything that's changing 
in addition to your own recognition of this? Well, I've started whispering mm -hmm. um, and trying to keep my voice very low. Um, and I've talked to other colleagues about it to try to find another space. And how, how's that going for you? Well, <laughs> we have limited resources, and so um, we're working on trying to identify a space. But because we really need the consultation rooms to see patients, it's been challenging. Mm -hmm. So can you um, tell me about any of the activities that were done in the training that have really stuck with you? Um, well, one of the activities that we did was um, an activity where we talked about the different words for the body parts that uh -huh. are in our vocabulary because so many of our patients don't use the sort of scientific terms that we use. Uh -huh. um, and so I think it helped to sort of desensitize us to that language and, and get us comfortable with all the language that patients might come in using. Um, and so it was both sort of, it was sort of entertaining and also a little awkward <laughs> at uh -huh. the same time. I'm um, hearing you laugh as you say it, so it yeah, it's, it was fun to have sort of this group of professionals in there sort of throwing around this vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, another activity that we did that I thought was um, really effective was that we watched um, these videos, these short videos mm -hmm. that showed us um, something happening at a facility that might contribute to stigma and discrimination. Um, and then we had really, really great discussions as a group around whatever it was that we were sort of seeing in the video. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, those were things that I think that a lot of people in the room could relate to and had seen happen in their own facilities, so it was, it was good to be able to have a discussion about them. Mm -hmm. um, did everybody seem to have the same reaction to the videos when you listened to them? And watch them? Hmm. I would say that um, people universally seemed to acknowledge that what was happening. So I'm stopping uh, this video because you have seen this now. And uh, yes, any any Hello. any uh, responses from the participants? How did they, they they find this interview as compared to the previous interview? You can type or you can unmute yourself and answer. Better, but she has still not asked permission for recording voice. If she has recorded any, madam, and oh, yes, she yes, this was she was taking notes also simultaneously uh, while recording. And uh, yes, she was ideally, she's not was... judgmental, she provided adequate, yes, and she also showed curiosity about knowing more. <laughs> Yeah, you are right. All the points are relevant, whatever you made. And in that recording process, you are right that uh, uh, she has not taken the consent. But again, just take it implied that she must have done it. This uh, this clip, we have, uh, uh, I mean, we have narrowed this clip and we have made it for that, that those many minutes in the actual interview, it was there. So we have cut that initial part maybe, and that's why. Otherwise, otherwise uh, it, uh, like Devayan is writing, it's a good paced, engaging interview with good opening section, appropriate explanation of the context, active listening throughout, probing in between, providing adequate time to respond. Jennifer is lighting, de developed rapport with her eye contact and uh, letting the respondent talk, active listening, silent reply, open-ended question, body language is good, humble language, exploring the subset questions, making sure that she listens. Shivangi is writing good interview, ask about the family, eye contact, more open-ended questions, details. Nilima is writing ice-breaking questions, showing interest, patient listening, better rapport, better one facial expressions were appropriate. Veena is writing empathy. So yes, all of you are right. You have summarized it well. So now you understand. So it is, you have now seen this and web. So these all thing will not come in one go when you go and conduct the interview. So these traits, it takes time to imbibe these traits slowly. So, but keep practicing. And then after maybe 10 or 15 interview, you will be very good at taking the interview. So now the another uh, question is like, uh, the, what is the difference between key informant interview and in-depth interview? So basically the key informant interview, you do the interview with people who are expert in their field. Like in case of RSV, we did the key informant interview with the district immunization officer, state immunization officer, officers, the AM who performs the immunization. So those are the people who know the 
particular thing well and who are experts or who are, hold a certain position, administrative position in the uh, community. It, they may not be representative of the community. It can be an individual capacity or it can be a designation capacity like professor or like head of the department of the institute uh, of a department or like the director of the institute. So by position, not in the individual capacity. So a person may be an uh, in-depth interview like if I am like if I'm the respondent, so for, uh, uh, and I'm a doctor too. So if I'm answering on behalf of a doctor, then it is, it will be a key informant interview. But if I'm answering as a lady, as a, as a woman, then I will be, it will be an in-depth interview. So it depends on the, for if you are holding a position or because of our, your occupation or because of your expert knowledge, if you are giving an interview, that is a key informant interview. And if you are giving interview by virtue of a human or by virtue of a person who has experienced something, then that person, that interview is an in-depth interview. But the procedure is same for the key informant interview or for the in-depth interview. So I'll just uh, show you that, uh, we have uh, shared the interview schedule with uh, this guide with all of you. It is in the form of a PDF file. I think it has been shared to you here in the uh, chat box also and on the WhatsApp also. So can you see this uh, interview guide? So this, uh, we have just compiled the questions which you people have framed in the breakout room. So this is the, how digital learning affecting the perception of MBBS students towards conventional teaching methods. Their question is, could you please talk about yourself? Prompts, a uh, name, a new use of teaching method that is one more uh, broad, uh, question uh, for which the, there are small questions like main source of learning. Did you join any coaching before joining MBBS? Can you share your experience? So like the, there are a few direct questions and there are a few like close-ended questions and open-ended questions. But more, most of the questions are how and what. So you can see that they are the open-ended questions. So this is uh, you now you not, are, excuse me, ma'am. We have not yeah, received it. What's WhatsApp group, ma'am, the interview guide. Okay, Shreyas, can you send uh, this? Ma'am, they have been sent as personal messages. On personal messages. So can you yes, please share no. on the... Okay, you see. share it over the WhatsApp group also, 